Before I start, can I have a show of hands? Is anybody not familiar with Conway's Law? Okay, good. So we'll do a, a brief overview first. So Melvin Conway wrote a paper in about 1967 called How Committees Invent. Um, and it's a really good paper. It's not long. It's really well written and really interesting. And there's a few great sort of insights in it. But the most famous one is the one he came out with where he says, organizations who design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. So what does that mean? Imagine in Conway's time, perhaps a company has an HR department and they might have a supporting IT team. They might have a payroll department with a supporting IT team. When payroll wants to send out a paycheck, they ask HR for the address of the person. HR sends them the address back and then they post out the paycheck. And the un underlying IT system might model that. So you might have an HR service that sends an HTTP request over to the, to the payroll service. And those um, architectures form because of the structure of the company. This is um, Conway's theory that, that he wrote about. Uh, when he wrote it, it was just a theory that he had. Obviously, he thought it you know, through very thoroughly. But uh, since then, people have actually gone on to do some experiments to see whether they can prove it. Uh, and the best one with the biggest sort of uh, data set was this um, exploring the duality between product and organizational architectures, a test of the mirroring hypothesis, where the mirroring hypothesis is another name for Conway's law. Uh, and what they looked at was um, architectures produced by open source teams compared with architectures produced by commercial software firms. Uh, and the, the prediction was that they would find more tightly coupled architectures in the commercial software firms because the people are possibly co-located. Um, they've got a much narrower kind of uh, remit um, and uh, that they are more closely uh, aligned. Whereas with the open source community, they're probably geographic geographically distributed. So they would imagine that the architect would be uh, much more loosely coupled. Uh, and, and they did find, as it says here, we find strong evidence to support the mirroring hypothesis. So there are experiments to show that this does hold true. Uh, and here it is in pictorial form. You might have seen this before. I really like it, especially the Oracle one. <laughs> so um, as a conference speaker, um, you submit a paper. The paper is accepted. You then have to write the talk, so you ask ChatGPT to do it for you. Uh, ChatGPT did an okay job. It came up with you know, an intro, three-point list, a conclusion. Uh, and the thing that caught my eye was the example that it used of Conway's Law, uh, which was the example of the design of the Intel 4004 processor, which is it's quite an interesting story. Uh, and it, it makes sense, possibly, that it could be related to Conway's Law because it was a uh, an international um, sort of co-project between Japan and America. So they produced a modular design with four modules on a chip. But actually, when you read into it a little bit more, what actually happened was th the Japanese company, Visicom, had asked Intel to build this chip for them. They'd sat together and come up with a rough design. And then the Japanese guys had gone back to Japan and over the years, they were sending more and more frantic messages. Where's my chip? Where's my chip? <laughs> Nothing was arriving. And so they eventually, um, Intel recruit this guy, Federico Fagin. But uh, he actually didn't have very long at all to produce the chip. He had to tweak the design a little bit. And he basically worked nights and weekends in order to deliver it to the Japanese guys. So it isn't really uh, you know, a well-run, distributed project that's produced a modular design. So I said to ChatGPT, where did you get this? And it went, oh, you know, the, 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 the Mythical Man Month. And I thought, I read the Mythical Man Month. I don't remember it being in there. And I went back and scanned it. It's not there. So I tried to Google anything to do with Intel 4004 and Conway's Law. Nothing. So I can only conclude that ChatGPT made up the example, which is impressive. <laughs> but a warning, don't, don't get ChatGPT to write your talks for you. <coughs> So the, the thing that I find interesting about Conway's Law is how people interpret it. So when I'm talking to people, um, they sort of fall into to three categories as to how they view it. So some people view it as a really positive thing. If they, you know, they can say, 
oh yeah, well, if we want to produce a microservice architecture, we need to have uh, small distributed autonomous teams or you know, if we're going to co-locate so we can build this sort of monolithic piece, it's going to be really efficient. Um, so they see it as something that, that helps them to design teams. Some people see it as a very negative thing, uh, you know, something to avoid. You know, oh, this highlights the importance of communication and collaboration. Without the effective communication, we're going to end up with these silos and we don't want them. Um, so that is kind of a view that Conway's Law is a warning um, as, as how you shouldn't build teams. And then there's the third group, which I think is, is the group that I fall into, which is just seeing it as an interesting thing. <laughs> Um, kind of like maybe a, the law of evolution. It's a thing that just happens. There's nothing you can do about it, um, but you can learn from thinking about it when you look at your project uh, and, and look at what you're doing. Um, you know, so it will inevitably reflect the organization's communication structure. Don't try and fight it. Just be aware of it. Um, and this talk was inspired by uh, a tweet that I saw a year back or so. You might have, have seen it. Um, uh, but the interesting thing about the tweet was the way that they linked it to Conway's Law because it, it, it was a tweet about um, the US elections and geography, geology. Uh, and I thought, well, yeah, that's an interesting point. How loose is this definition of Conway's Law? Uh, Conway himself said, you know, a system very broadly defined. So how, how far can we sort of push the boundaries and still claim that the, the cause and effects cause and effects that we're seeing are, are related to, to this mirroring hypothesis. So uh, I'll talk you through the, the story that was in the tweet that I saw. Um, and it kind of, uh, if we look at the definition of, of Conway's law, this organization defining a system, the organization would be uh, the United States of America. Uh, and, and this is the uh, voting outcome from, um, I think, 2016 elections. Uh, and you'll see the red is the Republican voters and the blue is the Democrat voters. And a lot of the South of America is red, but you see that strange blue sort of smile shape above Florida. Now this attracted the attention of a geologist because it exactly mirrors an underlying rock formation. So, um, so he, he'd seen underlying rock formation maps before and he was like, why on earth am I seeing the same tick shape in voter outcomes. Why do people who live on a certain type of rock vote Democrat and everybody else votes Republican? It was really strange. Uh, and so he started to look into why, uh, and it was really interesting. So the reason that there is a blue swoosh there is this is uh, the continents 100 million years ago, and you can still see the blue swoosh as the shoreline now around the base of this ancient American continent. And you can see it's all white there because it's very shallow, very shallow seas, very warm. There are lots and lots of uh, little animals, plankton, uh, things like that, which made, when they died, fell to the bottom of the sea and made the, the soil incredibly rich in minerals. Um, and so when the sea levels rose, when, when everything got colder and, and ice formed, uh, this land then became exposed. Uh, and it's known as the, the Black Belt in Southern America because the soil is very, very dark, and it's very, very rich and fertile. So um, very good for growing crops. And what do we know about the crops that were most profitable in the 18th, 19th century USA? Uh, cotton. So this black belt is where um, the cotton plantations were mainly situated. Uh, so here's a map showing cotton production um, in 1859. Uh, and the other thing that we know about cotton farming is that it's incredibly um, high um, effort to do it. Uh, it's a manual process. They used to pick the cotton by hand. And the only way that you could make a profit with, with employing enough people to run the cotton farm was to use slaves. So this blue band, because of the cotton plantations, also represents the location of, of, of many of the slave families. And when slavery was abolished, uh, lots of people did leave, but a lot of people stayed and still worked on the cotton farms, just now as badly paid employees. And there's enough families who stayed in the area um, to create this population band um, who can trace their ancestry back 
to, to slave families. And uh, the unsurprising thing about these families is that they're kind of keen on workers' rights and kind of slightly more likely to vote uh, Democrat than, than they are Republican. So hence, you can link an ancient C back to why these people are voting Democrat. Is it Conway's law? Uh, so if you reread it, organizations of the United States designing a system which is the voting system. They're producing a design which is copies of the communication structure. So you could say the communication structure is sort of where people are living and why they're living there because of the, you know, the, the, the work that they used to do. So I really like the idea that you could kind of loosen the boundary of Conway's law. It doesn't have to be uh, to do with technology. It's any organization, any system, and any communication structure. So that was the tweet that I saw, and I thought, uh, I wonder if there are any other sort of strange geological um, or geopolitical features that could be explained by Conway's law. And there was one right on my doorstep. Uh, so this is the northern end of Great Britain. So Great Britain, England and Wales are in the south, and Scotland is in the north. Uh, and where would it be logical for the border between England and Scotland to be? You can see the shape of the island. It goes in in a couple of places, and those very logical Romans have uh, built walls across it at various times um, when, when they were living in Britain. And very logical places, you know, they've gone for the narrowest point, they've used the river ends. So Hadrian's Wall first built in uh, 122, and then as more Scots embraced Roman ways of living, they kind of civilized the middle of Scotland and they built this second border, the Anstine Wall, again, a very logical, narrow gap to, to build it. But the, uh, the Scottish border is actually here. It kind of wiggles along and then goes up for some reason uh, and doesn't even meet a, a, a river at the end. It's, it seems very illogical. But if you look at the underlying geophysics of Scotland, you can see the line again. You can see it begins just above the red bit and then it kind of goes up and you get the same kink going up around the orange bit. So there is an underlying rock formation that um, is creating this border between England and Scotland. Uh, and why is it there? If we go back 600 million years, uh, you can see uh, there's England and Wales, the big yellow blob just above where it says Carolina. And then you can see a big blue sea. And there's Scotland right up above it at the top. So 600 million years ago, uh, Scotland was actually on a separate continent. But over the years, that sea has closed up completely. It was called the Eapetus Sea, and it's now totally gone. And all that there is is just um, a rock formation known as the Iapetus Suture. Uh, but it does create some very handy cliffs and valleys, which make the Scottish border very defensible. And so that's why it follows that strange and illogical line across you know, a, a broader chunk of Scotland. Is that Conway's law? So what's our geopolitical entity here? It's Scotland. What's the, uh, the system it's creating, the national borders? Uh, and, and the communications uh, structure is a, a big cliff. So it, it could be, couldn't it? I mean, yeah, we are really stretching the boundaries, but uh, it, it, it could still hold. And you can't talk about the uh, English-Scottish border without mentioning uh, Berwick-upon-Tweed and its Russian war. Uh, Berwick-upon-Tweed is right on the Iapetus suture. So um, over the years, you can see it's a highly fortified town. You can see all the old walls and things because it's been constantly contested between England and Scotland uh, over the centuries. Um, it's been English since about 1400, but uh, it did change hands about 13 or 14 times before that. Uh, and so when the king of England or Scotland um, would write declarations, they would specifically mention Berwick-upon-Tweed. Um, so uh, apparently, when Queen Victoria declared war on Russia in uh, 1854, the legend has it that she wrote, I, Queen Victoria of England, Scotland, and Berwick-upon-Tweed. And then when they declared peace, she forgot to mention Berwick-upon-Tweed. <laughs> and hence, it was technically still at war with Russia. Uh, there's no evidence of this, but it's a great story. Uh, and actually, in 1966, um, a Russian diplomat did come to Berwick-upon-Tweed and 
and declare that he was happy that <laughs> we, could, we could be at peace. And the mayor of Berwick upon Tweed apparently said that the Russians can now sleep safely in their beds. <laughs> so, yeah, unfortunately, there's not much evidence for this story, but it's a great story. So, um, I enough of looking at uh, geopolitical um, examples of Cromwell's law. Um, I was thinking, um, wh where else can we sort of look at and find uh, evidence of this law in action? Uh, and one of the things that uh, Conway says in, in the original paper, How Do Committees Invent, is he said, uh, by definition, a team cannot be organized and unbiased. Because as soon as you start to select a team to build a sub piece of your system, you're bringing in bias because you're bringing in individual people's opinions and the smaller the group the smaller the number of opinions uh, and I thought that was quite interesting and maybe we could look at some sort of control group bias examples um, and some of it's quite relevant today with uh, machine learning AI that kind of thing uh, in 2017 there was a survey of 600 tech leaders in America uh, and they all self-identified as progressive Democrats uh, and that could be seen for example uh, Facebook during the 2016 elections, they were purposefully repressing conservative news articles because of their own political leanings. So, um, you know, tech leaders are, are raising machine learning um, trained networks to be progressive Democrats. I mean, that might not be a bad thing, but it's certainly something to be aware of. Um, uh, and another good example, uh, Google. They had Google Brain, which is, is a very quite an early neural network they were training. Uh, and they wanted to broaden its um, sort of exposure to people. And so they had an Ask Me Anything residency where they invited people to come and submit some knowledge that could be trained into the, into the net. And uh, Jeff Dean, who was running the project, he said, oh, residents bring a wide range of backgrounds, areas of expertise. For example, we have physicists, mathematicians, biologists, neuroscientists, electrical engineers, as well as computer scientists. And apologies if there are any art students <laughs> in the room, because you'll see that's still quite a narrow range of expertise. And um, it was an online event, so um, they didn't actually see who they'd invited. And accidentally, it turned out there were no women, and everybody was white. <laughs> so um, it was a nice, you know, they had the right intentions, but uh, it, it kind of revealed quite a lot about how careful we have to be uh, training neural networks, because um, it's all about the input. Uh, <coughs> so there are a lot of neural networks in China as well, which are, again, slightly differently biased. Um, that um, Apparently, the, the kind of mix of people that work on them is very evenly mixed, male and female, but they are all Chinese. And a lot of it is state-funded. And um, here's an example. Um, they, they wanted to have AI-powered social credit system. Um <coughs> And th th this is the quote, to develop, to engineer a problem-free problem society by allowing the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. Ah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it's really interesting to see how um, different cultures might influence the, the networks that they're training. Um, so... Um, Facial recognition data is quite an interesting one. You know, it's something that we use all the time, uh, uh, but probably don't really think too much about how it's all set up. Uh, so there's a project called the Gender Shades Project, which set out to investigate um, how well that some of the top facial recognition software performed on, on a range of genders and skin tones. Uh, so they chose a Microsoft one, they chose Face++ and IBM Watson. And um, they took, I think, 1,300 subjects or so and, and checked how well the facial recognition could match the faces uh, based on uh, uh, the different uh, gender genders and different skin shades. So you can see it does pretty well across the board, but there is quite a significant gap with some of them. They do much better on lighter male faces than darker female faces. Uh, so why is this? Um, if we think about how neural networks are trained, how the sort of individual nodes are trained, it's quite a simple sort of feedback loop. The training data comes in, 
the network makes a guess, a prediction, then that's compared with what was expected. And if it's not very accurate, there's a sort of feedback loop which will adjust the network and then they'll try again. So um, there isn't much scope for input here in, in the loop, is there? You know, it's a very kind of black and white, were you right or wrong? But the piece where there is scope for um, uh, adjusting this is obviously in the training data. Uh, and what I didn't realize about the training data is that there aren't actually that many large data sets um, of faces. And companies don't own them themselves, they buy them. So uh, Microsoft, Face++ Plus Plus and so on, all will buy a huge uh, face data set and use it to train their neural networks. Uh, so I had a look at some of the uh, facial recognition data sets that you can buy. Uh, and these are what the data set companies themselves say about their data sets. So the LFW data set, they're, they're very honest. It's like, no, it's quite biased. <laughs> um, the Tufts Face database, um, 10,000 images. Is that massive? Uh, you know, it's not that massive, is it? But there's um, not that many people either. That there's only about 100 faces, just obviously must have been all from different angles. But then there is a nice broad range of, of different countries, different ages, and so on. Uh, and then there's UK T face, uh, and they claim they use this DEX algorithm, uh, which is double checked by human annotation. But when I looked into the DEX algorithm, um, it, it, it judged apparent age. So I don't know how that would be able to judge how you know, evenly distributed skin tone and gender are within a, within a data set. Uh, and then, to the best of their knowledge, the IMDB Wiki database is the largest facial database set. And that's because their images come from I IMDB or from Wiki. Uh, and so they're famous people. So that's quite interesting in itself, isn't it? So, um, and you probably do see this quite a lot. Facial recognition works a lot better on famous people because there's that many more pictures of them available that the networks can be trained to recognize them a lot more easily. So yeah, it's just, it's interesting. Is it Conway's law? So again, um, we've got an organization, so the big tech firms which are designing the systems. The systems are these AI classification systems, machine learning systems. And the communication structure, the only thing that actually goes into the networks is, is, is the big training data sets. So yeah, I mean, it, it could be, couldn't it? You could you could argue that that, that is Conway's law in action. <coughs> and uh, the, the more I thought about this, the more I sort of realized that we as developers are incredibly powerful. And perhaps you could rewrite Conway's law uh, with this famous gladiator phrase, you know, what we do in life echoes in eternity. I think we have to remember that our um, the, the, the developer base for any code is going to be much smaller usually than the user base. So, you know, the influences that we have and the decisions we make as developers are enormous. And it's probably very well, you know, worthwhile dwelling on that fact uh, as we go along. Uh, so, what did I decide to do next? I thought, uh, can I just ask a random question about my own project uh, and then see whether or not Conway Conway's law can answer this question. Uh, so I'm working um, on a Java development project at the moment. Um, we are building back-end microservices, uh, and we use a framework called DropWizard. A has anyone ever heard of DropWizard? No, <laughs> doesn't surprise me. Uh, and so I thought, well, maybe I can ask this question. Why does my project use DropWizard? It's, it's not a particularly usual choice. It makes it very difficult to source people that uh, can come and work on the project because nobody has any experience in DropWizard. Um, so can we use Conway's Law to kind of drill back and find a reason uh, as to why I'm using it? So here's a brief overview of my project. I'm working on a, a UK government project. This is its website you can go and have a look at. Uh, the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Um, so whenever we export animals or animal products from the UK, there's very often some kind of regulation around, you know, have those racehorses going to Hong Kong been properly vaccinated? Or have all, are all those chickens um, being exported? Have they been kept indoors because 
there's been a huge bird flu pandemic going on for the past few years and so it's been necessary to keep um, farm birds indoors and the vet has to certify that this is the case. Um, and it was a kind of paper-based system. You'd fill in a PDF form and send it uh, to a small office who would then send it out to a vet who would guarantee that they'd seen it and so on. Uh, and w th my project is to online this, turn it into online forms. And it's kind of driven by Brexit because there was expected there would be a huge increase in paperwork now that we've totally messed up all of our exports and imports. Um, so it's, it's not a huge system. It's, um, it's not a massive user base, but it's sort of millions a year. Um, and yeah, and as I mentioned, for these back-end microservices, we're using DropWizard. So this is what DropWizard says about itself. A Java framework for developing ops-friendly, high-performance RESTful web services. Uh, and it, it's what it's similar to is Spring. It's like a lightweight version of Spring. It doesn't do as much, and it does some things differently but it basically allows you to quick start a microservice uh, and package it up for deployment. Uh, so it has a similar sort of concept of controllers and, uh, and so forth. Um, it doesn't have dependency injection, so that's the big difference with Spring. Um, it uses shading, which if you've ever seen it, it's terrifying. <laughs> and um, every time we run our build, we get more and more warnings about how this really isn't supported and we really shouldn't be doing it. Um, and it creates this fat jar for deployment. Um, it's designed for RESTful JSON microservices, so there isn't any inbuilt support for other communication types. I mean, that's fine for us because that's what we do, but uh, it is a limitation. And it's not, I it is supported in that it's patched and so on and it moves up the Java versions, but they're not really driving it forward. They're not building new versions of it. So if you look at, you know, Spring 3, um, built to take advantage of GraalVM, there's not going to be anything like that I in DropWizard. Um, and, and it has quite a simple security model. You don't have the advantages of the spring security annotations. So it's OK, but it's not the best that, that you would have to choose if you were starting from scratch. Uh, so why do we use it? Um, so if we look at the organization, it's the UK government, the Animal and Plant Health Agency. And the structure that we're building is this certification system. And, and the communications method that we've used to build it is this thing that we have in the UK called Government Digital Services, um, which is it's a really cool drive um, from a government department to say, you know, we all know how to make good software. We all know it's got to focus on the user experience. We all know we need to work in an agile way. Uh, we all know that there's scope for reuse in things like um, CSS layouts. Um, and so um, they came up with this brilliant drive. And you, you'll see from the, the phrases that, uh, as a developer, it, it's probably somewhere that you'd like to work. They're focusing on the right things. We believe in working openly because making things open makes them better. You know, we start with user needs. It's brilliant. And it's not necessarily what you might expect from a government department. You know, the, the view of government departments, <laughs> they're not, you know, competing on the open market. Why do they need to be better? So... Um, it's quite interesting that such a brilliant drive has come out of such a sort of backwards organisation as the UK government. So if we look into the history of GDS, when it was formed, um, it was formed in April 2011. Uh, they commissioned Martha Lane Fox, who you probably remember her name from lastminute.com, to write this paper about digital by default, about how they could move government services forward in a digital way. Uh, so this is quite a progressive thing to do in 2011. Why 2011? What happened in Britain in 2011? Well, 2010, there was an election, and the results of the election was a coalition government. So there was a joint government between the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. That's really rare in Britain. It doesn't happen much at all. Usually we just have one party, sometimes we switch to another. But to have a coalition government is really rare. So I was thinking, is this why we have um, you know, this brilliant collaborative drive coming out at this time? Is it because a coalition government has to collaborate? You know, is this how I could link the decision to use Drop Wizard back to Conway's Law? Because I can say the co coalition drove collaboration, and that collaboration manifested itself in the gov government digital services way with all these really great ideas. 
And it was a leading edge for, for 2011, and that predates spring. So the reason that we use um, Drop Wizard is because it was a decision made before spring existed. Um, and as such, at the time, it, it was a leading edge solution. Um, you know, obviously things have moved on. We no longer have a coalition government. Maybe that's why, you know, any drive to replace this hasn't happened. But um, I, I felt that perhaps that this is the answer. Um, but again, it's very loose, but it's possibly Conway's law. Um, but so what? You know, you might believe my answer, or you might not. But w what does it matter? Wh what what possible use is there in bothering to figure out? things like why we use Drop Wizard. Uh, well, it, it gives us the confidence to change, to move to Spring, for example. So when we build new services now, we're using Spring, spring Boot. Um, and, and it also shows us that perhaps if we haven't reviewed our architectural decisions since 2011, we might need to create a review team to, to start doing that. Uh, so so it, it, it did sort of carry a useful purpose to have a look into it. Um, but what next? Um, so if you started looking into Conway's Law, you might sort of say, oh yeah, this is um, affecting my project in this way, very interesting. Is there anything else that you can do once you've established that there is some sort of link between your organization structure uh, and your architectures? Um, so people do try this and they call it the inverse Conway maneuver. So understanding why their teams are structured in a certain way and trying to change that. Um, so for example, um, if we have product-oriented teams, so this is the idea that um, your development team is freed up to purely wo work on uh, business functionality. So all of the kind of tech debt, all of the managing pipelines and something is just done by somebody else and you've got teams which are much more tightly aligned to the business. Um, is that going to impact more the architectures, make them more tightly tied to um, your organizations? Do you need to step back and review that? Um, and again, if we're using domain-driven design, we can do things like um, event storming. We can get together with the business and understand better um, how they're operating. Does that give us more of an influence to say, well, why do you have separate HR and payroll departments? You know, we, you seem to be doing the same thing kind of questions. So uh, there are kind of uh, methods you could use to, once you understand that Conway's law is influencing your design, you could then try and change that. Uh, but it wouldn't be an instant fix. It wouldn't, you know, it, it would be a long-term change and you couldn't say whether or not there would be any benefit to do that. Um, but the more interesting thing for modern architectures is, is my communication structure already affected by my system? Because when Conway originally wrote his paper, um, that there wasn't so many kind of pre-built solutions um, to use. So it was more likely that they would be building bespoke software for a given part of the organization. Whereas these days, um, there are much more kind of widely available technologies that a business might sort of say, oh, I want that. Um, and I was thinking particularly about the influence of big data on retail. So um, the ability to capture every single kind of mouse move, click, pause that uh, retail website users make, and then to analyze those quantities of data to come up with um, reasons why users are buying certain things and then to influence that. That sort of loop wouldn't be possible without the ability to capture all the clicks. So, you know, it's more of a business model which is based on the available architecture. So it's sort of the complete opposite for the communication structures affecting the business. And I was sort of thinking, if you think back to that model of training in neural net, this kind of looks like the retail um, technology model or the retail business model that we see. You know, the, the, the website data comes in, they make a prediction on sales, they compare that to what's actually happened, they can tweak the prediction model. So they've almost built a business around the technology rather than the other way around. Um, so, what can we conclude um, from all this? So, um, first of all, uh, the first thing that I think is the most interesting is to think about how you interpret Conway's law. 
So it, it's still relevant today, despite having been mused about in, in 1967, 1968. Uh, and think for yourself about whether you think it's, it's something positive or negative, or whether you sort of fall into the neutral observer category. Um, and then that sort of led me on to think, remember how powerful you are. Um, you know, you can build bias, in, well, you will build bias into your systems. There's nothing that you can do about that, apart from just try and be aware um, of it and sort of, you know, note that in, in your architectural logs, perhaps. Um, and as I said, the code user base is always going to be much bigger than the, the contributor base. Well, usually, I would imagine. Um, and then the third point is just to stay curious. You know, this, this talk has just been some interesting stories, really. <laughs> um, but t to keep your curiosity going, to look into things like that, um, I think it's very important to uh, sort of keep yourself fresh as a developer, to keep yourself interested in what you do, prevent yourself sort of becoming stale and doing the same things over and over. Um, obviously, don't trust ChatGPT. Uh, I think it's quite cool, actually, that this is going to return us to the world where we have to go back to being aware of primary and secondary sources and so on. Because for so long, if you just search for something on a search engine, you'd read the maybe the top 30 results and you'd think that you now have quite a good idea of it. But if you ask ChatGBT and it just makes stuff up, we're going to have to go back to learning how to research properly. So that's definitely a positive for all of us. Um, and yeah, with your curiosity, look to study the past of your project. Some projects are super, super long running, so you can end up with a sort of, um, a, a sort, of sort of call it vestigial architecture. So, um, you know, as humans, we have this appendix that we don't seem to really use anymore, and it, it seems to be something to do with eating grass that we don't do anymore, but we still have it with us. And our architectures, in the same way, will carry vestigial historical pieces with them and, and it's really good to just stop and go why are we doing that you know can we figure it out and maybe you can use Conway's law to trace back some of the ancestry uh, of your architectures so yeah that was it for me thank you very much for coming